My name is Patrick Gregory. I'm the Managing Director of the Cutler Center for Investments and Finance and the Director of the Babson College Fund. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Monish Pabrai is the Managing Partner of Pabrai Investment Funds, which has more than 500 million in assets under management and invests in public equities using a focused value approach. With this approach, his fund has delivered annualized returns of 12% since inception in 1999 versus 8% for the NASDAQ index. Monish has been profiled on Forbes and Barron's, appeared frequently on CNN, CNBC, and Bloomberg TV, and is the author of two books on value investing. Those are The Dundo Investor and Mosaic Perspectives on Investing. We expect tonight's discussion to last approximately 60 minutes. He's going to be interviewed by Ane Gawande, who is an undergraduate student and one of the sector managers in the Babson College Fund. Ane will spend the first 20 to 30 minutes on prepared questions and then open it up to the audience for Q&A. I should note that recently, a 30-minute Zoom call with Monish raised $7,600 on eBay for the Dakshana Foundation, which he founded for gifted but underprivileged children. Put differently, the next hour is valued at just over $15,000. We're certainly in for a treat and grateful to Mr. Pabrai for taking the time to speak with us this evening. With that, I'll turn it over to Ine. Thank you for that, Patrick. So just to kick things off, Manish, value as a style class has been underperforming growth for several years. How has this changed your investment philosophy? And can you expand on the idea of compounders that you started to talk about and how you go about looking for those? So Ane, anyway, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. And just before I answer your questions, I just want to state that Babson is a very unique place in the universe. And its focus on entrepreneurship is one of the reasons why it's so unique. So generally speaking in business schools, entrepreneurship is a neglected area. And uh, it's a neglected area because generally business school professors will generally find it hard to get consulting assignments if they specialize in entrepreneurship. If you're a business school pro professor, you specialize in branding or leadership or organizational development or marketing, you will have a lush consulting career on the side. But if you specialize in entrepreneurship, us entrepreneurs are too cheap and scruffy to engage these school professors to tell us what to do because we also think we know what to do. So basically, it ends up that most, and also the other, the other thing is that to teach the subject well, you would have needed to be a practitioner. And generally speaking, the entrepreneurs usually don't have the PhDs and the credentials so, you know, they would have a harder time with tenure, you know, getting appointments and so on. So for a multitude of reasons, basically entrepreneurship gets ignored. And I think that it is the engine that drives it, drives everything. It's the engine that created these United States, made us one of the richest large countries in the world and the most powerful nation in the world. So at the core of all of that, is an entrepreneur with an impossible dream that he's chasing, he or she is chasing. So anyway, after more than two decades, Babson finally called, I was ready for the call. So thank you. Anyway, I think that your first question, if I can still remember it, you know, value and growth are two sides of the same coin. You cannot really separate them and you cannot say, for example, value has underperformed and growth has done well. Any business is worth the sum of all the future cash it's going to produce from now till judgment day discounted to a present value. And so if a business is growing 10% a year, growing 15% a year, growing 50% a year, or declining 5% a year, all of them have future cash flows coming out, which drive the result in terms of what that business is worth. And if we are paying less than those discounted cash flows, meaningfully less than those discounted cash flows, then we are engaging in value investing. And I think that is timeless. If we are willing to pay anything for those future cash flows, 
then usually that has led to not such good results in the long term. And so some of the things that we are seeing currently in the markets are frothy. And some of the things, you know, eventually we will find out who's been swimming naked when the tide goes out. So that will become apparent. But I'll just give you an example. In early 2000, I visited Microsoft headquarters in Redmond. And one of my in early investors, the funds were just about a few months old then, he had said to me, hey, listen, he was he was a very early employee at Microsoft, done well, had risen and done well. He said, look, if you ever find yourself in Seattle, I could probably introduce you to some current and former Microsoft employees who might have an interest in your fund. So I said, what a coincidence. I'm going to be there day after tomorrow. And so he said, oh, that's great. So I spent a day where he took me to different offices in Microsoft and I met with a bunch of current and former employees. And, you know, when I was, you know, suggesting that Fabry funds may be a place they, they could put some money, most of them had almost all of their assets in Microsoft in stock and options. And of course, their paychecks came from the company. And Microsoft in 2000, when I looked at it, it was a very successful company, but was very overvalued. So I told them, look, I don't think it's a good idea to have this much exposure to Microsoft because I think, quite frankly, the future results aren't going to be that great. So their their perspective and their response to me was, well, Bonish, you really don't understand technology well, and you don't understand our company well. We have done nothing but go straight up for 24 years, and that's all we've always done. The stock always does well, and it will continue to do well. So I said, well, you know, the the math is against you because you're producing less than 10 billion a year in cash flow and your stock is valued at 600 billion you know probably the second most valuable company on the planet or something at the time and i just said that unless those cash flows go up quite dramatically it's just not going to be worth that money and it turned out that right from 2000 till about 2015 or 2016 or so Microsoft was a terrible company to own, even though the business did really well. So the company did well, the business did well, but the stock was just too overvalued. And so even though cash flows were higher in years after 2000, it just wasn't enough to keep that. So in fact, at one point you had a 70, 80% drop in market cap. So it was a, it was a rough ride. And Cisco had the same issue and so these are not, you know, these are not fly by night pets.com type businesses, which had no business model. And we see some of that today where there are companies where the valuations look quite extreme. I haven't studied them in detail, but if you were to do these future cash flow calculations, so if you take a company like, let's say, Snowflake, I mean, I would love to see the future cash flow calculations on Snowflake for the next 20 years. And that would just give you the answer whether it's overvalued or not. So value and growth are the same, one and the same, joined at the hip. And it's all about buying those future cash flows at well below what they're worth. Thanks for that, Monish. And I guess moving on to the second question, you, you spoke about how Microsoft's market cap at one point fell 60, 70%. There was a similar story where your fund lost 65 to 70% in the great financial crisis. I think as a young investor, what I want to know is, you know, how do you maintain your conviction, your so-called intestinal fortitude and continue to remain to hold when, you know, things aren't working out for you? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So I think that in general, if you are going to be a participant in auction driven markets, you have to understand that these markets overshoot and undershoot all the time. And so there are times that markets get euphoric and there are times the market gets pessimistic. I think like Charlie Munger says that three times in his life so far, Berkshire has dropped 50% or more from the previous high. And he just considers that like kind of par for the course. So at the time in 08, 09, when we lost two thirds of value, the intrinsic value was a lot higher. 
And so one has to have the right framework in those times. And I mean, so let me take a step back. So if you look at any stock on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ, and just look at the 52 week range on that stock, you will find like something is traded from 50 to hundred dollars in the last 12 months and currently valued at 80 or something, or 40 to 90 and currently valued at 85 or something. So the, the thing is that you'll almost always across all these stocks see like a, a hundred percent Delta between the, the high and low price in a 12 month period. And these are not 12 month periods with a stretch. Like if you could go back and look at any 12 month period. You could look in 2008 or you could look at 2007 or 2006 or 2015, you'll find the same phenomena. So auction driven markets causes this attenuation because prices are set in the near term by people voting with their, by buying and selling their shares. And in the long run, they get weighed appropriately. They get weighed based on what they're worth. So, in 2008 and 09, when we were down two thirds, our funds were very undervalued. In nine months, I think in the year, in 2009, we were up, I think the funds were up over 110%, for example. So it's not like those businesses did a lot better. It's that we were sitting very undervalued at that point. And I think for the next few years, the funds did very well. So I think that if you're going to participate in auction driven markets, you have to understand volatility is, is part and parcel of that. So there are a few rules on that front. The first rule is not to be leveraged. So leverage becomes lethal when you are going to have large drawdowns because then your broker is going to tap you on the shoulder and ask you to send more cash just as the moment you happen to be short of cash. And uh, that's not a good situation to be in. So first is avoid leverage at all times. And the second is that, you know, I always remember this old saying, if wealth is lost, nothing is lost. And if health is lost, something is lost. And if character is lost, everything is lost. So we are only talking about temporary loss of wealth. So it has never bothered me when my portfolio has dropped a lot or the funds are down a lot because in general, those very times when that is happening generally tend to be very orgasmic periods in terms of opportunities to invest in. So I'm more interested in, hey, this is a good time to improve my portfolio. Can I get rid of a lesser quality business and maybe a better quality business? Because when everything's being thrown out, they're getting thrown out in different ways. And so some things get more deeply undervalued than others. And so you can do some reshuffling. I mean, like in 2008-09, commodity prices and commodity stocks got crushed. I mean, they just went to numbers that made no sense. And it was happening at such a furious place that uh, I created a basket of commodity bets. I mean, companies in the commodities area. And I just kept putting 2% into each bet because I didn't have that much time to really drill down on the businesses. And so we had like seven or eight different commodity bets. Not one of them did not work. I mean, every single one of them was at least a double in a relatively short period of time. And some of them went up seven, eight times. So they went up a lot. So it was just a great time. So I think that's the, that's just par for the course with auction driven markets, you're gonna have uh, volatility and you should just be comfortable with that. That totally makes sense. And I think to expand on your point, um, you're very famously known to run a very concentrated portfolio. I'm wondering if you can you know, lend some insight into how you think about structuring your portfolio and some of the other portfolio management related issues that a portfolio manager may face. Yeah, so I think I think you should think of yourself not as a investor, but more as a partner in in a business. I think that's a a better way of looking at the business. So you might say I you, you might own like you know 0.1 percent or 0.01 percent of the company, but you should think of yourself as a co-owner of the business. And so once you 
kind of take an approach where you think of yourself as the owner of a company. When you look at entrepreneurs and you look at you know great entrepreneurs like Sam Walton or Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, any of them, you one thing you'll notice is that in, in general, they are extremely non-diversified. So when they are building their businesses, sometimes 99% of their wealth is in a single business. Many times that single business is privately held, illiquid, cannot be sold, et cetera. You know, some couple that owns a Chinese restaurant, for example, you know, they may have everything in, in that business and they're not diversified. They're just all in on. So we as investors have a better kind of play of a set of hands to play than the typical entrepreneur. So the entrepreneur is almost naturally driven towards extreme concentration, right? 90 plus percent of assets in one particular business. Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett both believe, you know, Buffett says that if you understand a few businesses well, it is madness to put any money in your 25th best or your 30th best idea. And Charlie Munger would be more direct and he would say that there's no need to have a portfolio of even more than five stocks. So his perspective is a three stock portfolio is more than enough. So in my personal accounts or my IRAs and things like that, I rarely have more than two or three stocks. Sometimes I just have one stock, my highest conviction idea. In Pabrai funds, because it's OPM, other people's money, I have told my investors that I won't put more than 10% at cost into a single idea. So I stick to that. But it has happened in the past that we've had a single position or two positions become 60, 70% of the portfolio. And because they've gone up so much and such. And at those times, I've been reluctant to cut them back. So I don't think you need to have too many positions. I definitely think that it, it is very hard to outperform the index if you have a 20 stock portfolio with 5% going in at the max in any company and that sort of thing. I think you should, if you understand a bunch of businesses, there are clearly a set of businesses that you understand extremely well. And there's a difference between the ones that you understand extremely well and not so well. And then also kind of in there's a convergence between a business that you understand really well and that particular business being very undervalued, then you need to step up to the plate. Or like Buffett says that when it's raining gold, don't put out a thimble, put out a bucket. That's certainly helpful. And I'll ask my last question before we open it up for Q&A. Monish, when you build a checklist to screen for new companies, and now as you start looking for long-term compounders, what are you looking for? In other words, in the story of Arjuna, when he aims for the fish's eye, what is that center of eye? What is that one piece that every company you look at has to have? Yeah, so actually that's a great question because I went through a, a significant change on my thinking last year on that. So for most of my career as a professional investor, I took the approach of trying to buy a dollar bill for 40 or 50 cents or less and sell it for 90 cents or a dollar, kind of capture that arbitrage. And hopefully if the intrinsic value went up in that period, then it could be more than a 2X. Or if I bought it at like, for example, 20 cents or a dollar, it could be a four or five X. Like in the, during the financial crisis, you know, those commodity plays were pennies on the dollar. They were very cheap. The change in thinking I went through last year was to switch from looking at these undervalued businesses to looking at great compounders. And the one difference is that I've made many investments in the past in great compounders, but the problem was that they would get to full price or maybe even get to a little bit overpriced. And I would see it as, as risky to keep holding. And I'd want to go put it into some other investment. And of course, the, the negative with that is that in taxable accounts, it's tax inefficient. 
And in great states like Massachusetts and California, we have even more extreme res results because of all the of the high state income taxes. So, so it's very tax inefficient if you are in taxable accounts. And the second is that if you can identify businesses with very long runways that you can buy even at small discounts for intrinsic value, and they may not be 50% off, and then you are right on the, the runways and the long-term value creation, then those can turn into 10 baggers or 100 baggers. And in those scenarios, just a couple of positions can make a big difference. So I'll give you an example. You know, in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, there was this notion of the nifty 50, which was that you identify these 50 great businesses, which were quite richly valued at the time, but they had great future prospects. And the thinking was just buy this basket of these 50 businesses, don't worry about the price, and everything will take care of itself. And so this basket included things like McDonald's, Coca-Cola, it had, you know, Polaroid, Xerox, Kodak. So they were, these were some, you know, I mean, if you look at a company like McDonald's in 1970, I mean, you could not see the end of that runway. I mean, just a, such a huge, massive runway. And even now it's growing, you know, it's been 50 years since then and it's growing, Coke is still growing and so on. But the end result of that Nifty 50 wasn't great because some of these companies were trading at 70, 80, 100 times earnings. And first of all, you had the crash in 73, 74, which really, I mean, 73, 74 combined, the market lost like two thirds of value. So these companies just got crushed. So first of all, if you had strong intestinal fortitude and you know you saw your portfolio go down 75%, and you decided, I'm, well, it's not a big deal, I'll keep holding. Even after that, the pain wasn't over because they were just so overvalued. But there's a kind of a small ignored footnote in the Nifty 50. There's a controversy whether Walmart was in the Nifty 50 or not. So Walmart had come public in 1970. If you put Walmart in the Nifty 50 and you put 2% into Walmart, and you run the numbers, the Nifty 50 beats all the indices by a mile, okay? So it does really well. If you take out Walmart, it performs terribly, okay? And Walmart is in there at just 2% weightage at the beginning. So one business, one business at 2% weightage causes this, because Walmart, in 1970, when they had come public, I mean, the market cap was less than 30, 40 million. It was a very small business at the time. And look at the runway. You know, it's a 50 year runway, it's still going. And so, one of the things that took me a long time to figure out, I should have learned this a long time ago, is if you are, like, if I have a portfolio of 10 stocks, carefully picked and they're all compounders with long runways and they aren't bought at ridiculous valuations, et cetera, like the Nifty 50 was, you may not need more than one or two of those to have a good run as long as the rest of them don't cause you too much heartburn. So it is a given that when you make 10 bets, at least four of them are not going to work the way you think they are. So predicting the future of businesses is not a easy thing to do. But even if you have a 40% error rate, in the case of the Nifty 50, you had a 98% error rate and you still did well if you were right on the 2%, right? So that's something to keep in mind. And the other thing is that when you think of yourself as an owner of a business, because that's the mindset you have to be, because the only way you'll be able to keep, no one other than the Walton family has kept Walmart stock from 1970 till now, or even 1980 till now, or even 1990 till now. And why is that? You know, is it not obvious it's a great business? 
is it not obvious that it has, you know, very strong ethics and moat and all of that? You know, there's a lot of things very obvious about, about Sam Walton and Walmart. So just to give you an, a little bit of example there is I made, an, I made an investment before my enlightenment of 2020. I made an investment in 2019 in this company in Turkey, in Istanbul. And uh, when I made the investment, the market cap of this company was $19 million, one nine. And the best that I could tell the liquidation value of the business, because they, they, they've got 12 million square feet of warehouses, uh, they have got the, the largest freight operations network, the largest truck fleet in Turkey, and so on. They've got a bunch of businesses. Liquidation value was at least around $500 million or so. And that wasn't even the best part. The, the people who ran the business were exceptional capital allocators. So I was buying a business, you know, probably less than five cents on the dollar you know, the kind of opposite of the nifty 50, you can say. So I said, okay, this is great. You know, we'll, we'll hold this for a while. And, and I was lucky, I think that because Turkey has got so much trading volume, the average holding period for most of the retail investors is a few hours or a few days. They've got very high stock volumes. And Buffett has another, another quote that the stock market is a mechanism to transfer wealth from the active to the inactive. And so my funds own one third of this company now, and we bought the one third for about $7 million, a little less than 7 million. It's gone up about seven or eight times in the last, let's say 20 months or so. But when I look forward, maybe 10 or 20 years, and I say, okay, you know, the intrinsic value is 500 million. What do I think this father son team that runs it can do in terms of growing intrinsic value? So I'm thinking, you know, probably on a bad day, they probably triple it in 10 years or something, or maybe they might even do more than that. So it might, it might be worth maybe a billion and a half or something in 2030, maybe 10, you know, three X from where it is. So what do I need to do? I just need to be really good at sitting on my ass and nothing else. The main challenge that I have is to just spend all my time talking to students at Babson for the next 10 or 15 years and let the father son team. So they, they own like 40 odd percent of the company. I'm their, you know, idiot passive minority investor and happily cheering them on from the sidelines. And the son is very young. He's about 35. So I think this is kind of like a three or four decade runway. So my first stop on this business will be in 2030 to work like Rip Van, Rip Van Winkle, wake up and say, oh, where are we at? Oh, we are a billion and a half market cap. Okay, that sounds good. And are they still kicking ass? Yeah, they're still kicking ass. Okay, let me go to sleep for another 10 years. And we'll wake up and see what's going on after that. So this company was one and a half percent of our assets when we invested, right? And the other 90 and a half, 98 and a half percent is not exactly slouches. You know, it wasn't invested in Kodak at 100 times earnings. I think those other bets have some legs as well. And so my, the number one skill you need to do well as an investor is extreme patience. So if you are the kind of person who loves to watch paint dry, this is the business for you. If you get really excited about watching a white wall drying, this is just perfect for you. Thank you for that, Manish. I love that story. And I'm going to invite everyone in the class to raise their virtual hands and I'll call on, I'll call on to you to unmute and ask a question to Manish. Okay, we got Manny and then we'll follow that with Shasha and John. Hi Manish, thank you for taking the time to come speak with us today. I was just curious to see your opinion on the current macro state of the global economy. We have around 14 trillion negative yielding sovereign debt. You know, equity markets are at all time highs in terms of PE ratios on average indices. Do you think that we're gonna see a significant correction? Um, what are your views on current valuations and how are you personally handling this with your funds? Okay, yeah, so 
99% of what grows on on this planet, I do not understand. Most of what you said just now went way above my head. You know, so my little brain can only handle little things. It cannot handle these big thoughts like, you know, what's going to happen with the Federal Reserve balance sheet and what's going to happen with all our debt and what's going to happen with all these strange things going on around the world. The At the end of the day, what mattered for Walmart was Sam Walton and his principles and his work ethic and his team. That's what drove the end result for Walmart. So if you look at Walmart from 1972 to now, you know, right as they got going, they had the oil shock, they had the impeachment of a president, they had sky high interest rates, you know, price controls, huge lines at gas stations. And then we had all these, you know, we had the Vietnam War and then we had the Gulf War and then we've got this endless Afghanistan war and Iraq and so on. So there's endless stuff going on all around the world. But through all of that, Walmart did just fine. And through all of that in the last 27 years, Mr. Bezos did just fine, right? So, so I think the, the important thing I think for investors is to focus on the micro. Don't focus on the macro. Try to understand certain businesses that you think are understandable and try to get an, a sense of where they, those businesses are headed. And if you have a very high degree of conviction about where those businesses are headed. So like, for example, when I went to Turkey in July of 2019, the macro scene was like this. They thought the currency was gonna implode, okay? Foreigners were pulling their money out en masse from the Turkish market. Like, there's all these fund managers saying, Turkey is done, leadership is questionable, currency is going to go bananas, they've got weird fiscal policies, all of that. And I'm going in as the theater is empty. You know, there's a fire in the theater and everyone's exiting through all the exits and I'm going into this burning theater, right? And my take was that, okay, so we have this 12 million square feet of warehouses and we're gonna convert dollars into a certain ownership stake of those warehouses. We don't really care whether it was for three days in Turkish lira before it went into the warehouses, because now my stake is a certain ownership of those warehouses. What the currency is is irrelevant. Those warehouses have enduring value and the, their leases were you know, indexed to inflation and all of that. They were 100% leased and they were leased to Amazon and Carrefour and Ikea and all these companies. So my take was that I'm buying the warehouses for one year's rent, okay? I'm paying $3 a square foot to buy the, the warehouses. The rent is $3 a square foot, okay? So, you know, you're giving me, it's like going and buying some apartment building in, in LA where I can buy for one year's rent. You know, who's crazy to give that to me? Nobody. But they were giving it to me in Istanbul in 2019. And so I couldn't care less what was going to happen to the lira. I said, the lira can do whatever it wants. It's irrelevant. So we went in. We didn't care what happened to the lira. The lira went down 40% within six months after I invested. Okay? Didn't matter because in dollar terms, we were up 7x. In lira terms, we're up like 12x, but who cares? Because those, the cement prices, if the lira goes down dramatically, cement prices are gonna go up. And if cement prices go up, the cost to make a new warehouse goes up quite dramatically, which means the cost of the existing warehouse goes up. So I, I said, it's not gonna matter. None of this is gonna matter. So the thing is, Forget all the macro mumbo jumbo, whatever else is happening, and all this you know noise with Bitcoin and you know the sh the shorting of GameStop and all that. This is all just to get the popcorn with a lot of butter and just watch the show. That's all you want to do: watch the show. And then the real stuff is elsewhere, where 
no one's paying attention and something's just being ignored and whatever else. Thanks, Shasha. You can ask your question. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again for trying to speak with us. I'm Shasha. I'm a graduating senior. Uh, my question is kind of similar to, I guess, it is a question. Um, I guess I'm just more curious on your whole process. It sounds like, you know, investing stocks domestically, internationally, across all asset groups, across all industries, like, that's a huge basket of options. And how do you even, like, narrow it down to a small amount? Not that all of them open to a point, but, like, I find it really hard to just narrow narrow everything down. So, like, what is the screening process and how does that, how, how does that work? Yeah, so both approaches are valid. So if you take a very narrow view of the world and you say that, okay, I understand a certain few things. So I'll give you the example. Charlie Munger has a very good friend, John Ariega. He's a billionaire and he only invests in real estate within two miles of the Stanford campus, right? I mean, that's all he's ever done in his whole life. If you went to John Ariega and said, hey, we've got this strip mall in Sacramento, he wouldn't even let you finish the sentence. He'd say, I'm not interested. And he said, no, no, it's really cheap. Or if I went to him and said, listen, John, I got this, this warehouse is in Turkey. I would not be able to finish the sentence. Okay, he's not interested. Okay, and that's fine. Because when people come to him with Stanford real estate around the campus, who knows it better than him? Nobody else knows him better than him. I mean, if you walk down the street with him, he can just point to buildings and tell you exactly what the rent is, exactly what the value is, exactly what the cash flows are. I mean, he has it wired. And so when things get euphoric, he exits his portfolio. And then when things get, you know, very pessimistic, he buys it all back. And he's done that several times in his career and he's, he's done really well. So to do well as an investor, you do not need, you do not need a large circle of competence. What is most important is to stay within the circle, right? So it doesn't matter how much you understand, but it's important to understand the boundaries of what you understand and to stay within those boundaries. What I was finding is I was finding that when I'm looking at things in the US, I was just not able to find things that looked undervalued. I just couldn't, in, and I'm talking about before COVID in 2018, 2019, I was finding it hard. So what I did is I, over the years, these people have contacted me. Like for example, there's a, a very good investor in Korea and it's very clear from the interaction we had that he's extremely well-trained and deeply versed in the Graham Buffett Munger way of thinking. And what he invests in Korea is just, you know, those deep value things. So I told him, hey, David, listen, would you mind if I came to Seoul and we spent a few days just visiting all the companies in your portfolio? And he said, oh, Mona should be a fun, fun experience to hang out. And so I said, okay. So I made several trips to Seoul where I just went through the businesses that he had all, and because it's already pre-selected, right? Already been through one set of filters with him. I could clearly see how he thinks. And so I say, okay. And then similarly in Turkey, my man in Turkey, God bless him. I did the same thing with him. Okay, I just said, hey, listen, can we just hang out in Istanbul? I hear the tea is great. I heard that you hear the Turkish coffee and the baklava is great. And in between those, we'll go meet a few companies. And he said, oh yeah, that's great. We, we did that. Now, I had to do some tweaks because these guys in these places, they tend to be more heavily Graham than Munger, which means that they are much more focused on these deeply valued businesses versus the compounders, right? So I'm more interested in the compounders, but I still wanted to just see what they had. What I did is I tried to educate them about moving from the deep value to the compounders because these are very cheap markets. Korea is a very cheap market. Turkey is a super cheap market and was even cheaper in 2019. I mean, you could buy the Coke bottler in Turkey for, I don't know, seven times earnings, okay? You cannot buy a Coke bottler in the United States for seven times earnings. Coca-Cola company owns a stake in that business in Turkey. 
Okay, there's nothing wrong with it. It's it's similar to the bottler here. It got it's in fact it's got better economics because it's got higher growth than we have over here. So there are, there are lots of great businesses like that. And uh, what I was able to do is in in a few geographies using these friends of Monish, I was able to expand my circle a little bit, right? Because I was just able to because I could rely on them. I said, look, are they honest? What's the local kind of know-how on these people and, you know, the auditor and that sort of thing. So, the, you know, just the, the things that would take me a much longer time to figure out was easier because they had done a lot of the work already. So, but I would say that you don't need to try to figure out the whole world. Just focus on what you easily understand. And one of the things that you most easily understand are the things, are the products and services that you use. So if you use Amazon, that's a starting point, just trying to understand that company. You know, if you're, you know, a fan of Peloton, that's a starting point to understanding that company. So I would say that the starting point should be maybe companies that you have some familiarity with. And then, then from there, you go through and try to understand how does the company make money and what are the runway, what's the growth prospects? Is it at a great price or not? And so on. Thanks for that, Manish. John McDowell, you're next. And then if we have time, George and Matt. Yeah, Manish, great to have you here. I was wondering when you say you're, say you're looking at a new market, do you look up top at the total addressable market? It's something that's just growing by leaps and bounds and then try to narrow down that funnel and find investments in that space? Because obviously with coronavirus and the pandemic, we've had so many structural changes in the economy where 10 years of change have happened overnight. The biggest one I'm looking at is connected TV. You've got $60 billion worth of advertising still going to old school cable TV, only 7 billion going to streaming, but the eyeballs are over here on streaming and the ad dollars just haven't caught up. So I'm hugely bullish on that space. I want to get your thoughts on some structural changes you've seen in the coronavirus and looking, did you look at those sectors and then narrow it down to find investments in them as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, that's a good question. Usually I, I go bottoms up. I usually don't go top down because I'm, I'm much more interested in how a business would work. I mean, I, I'm not saying that your approach has any flaws in it. It's perfectly fine. There's a hundred ways to get to Mecca. They're all fine. I personally have, just got more comfort looking at a particular business and first asking myself, okay, is this something I understand, right? That's my first question to ask. And then if I can say, yes, I think I understand this, then I'd say, okay, what's it worth? You know, because if you understand it, then you'd be able to figure out what it's worth. So I would say that when you look at ad dollars, for example, and you look at the you know, universal ad dollars, if you looked at some streaming play or you know, some digital play where the ad dollars are changing. I mean, I would say that, like, let's say if we look at a business like Twitter, right? I haven't spent much time looking at Twitter. I do recognize it's a very powerful platform. And I also recognize that they probably have the ability to monetize way more than they are doing today. In fact, they used to not monetize at all, right? And Google is the same way, where there's so many things that they give away for free, or so many things where they don't really even try to monetize. When you start to kind of tweak those and say, okay, if I were running this business and I, I don't want to, you know, kill the goose that's laying the golden eggs, but can I get more eggs out of this goose? In most cases, the answer is yes, big time. I mean, even the other day, I saw a notice on my Netflix, which just said, oh, by the way, we're now going to $17.99 a month, okay? And uh, warm regards, right? Uh, they can go from $17.99 to $19.99 to $22.99. And I don't think that disconnect rates are going to be anything near the percentage increase that they're... So if they bump up prices by 15%, for example, which is, I think, approximately what they were doing, on that last go round, I don't think the disconnects are going to be 15%. I think Netflix is like an IV drip. We all need it. I mean, how are you going to, you know, breathe without Netflix? 
you know so and and they they've known that they've undervalued and un- I mean, I used to think, oh, 10 bucks, we get all this stuff for 10 bucks. This is so awesome. And yeah, he was just getting us addicted. And uh, over time, that's going to be bumping up, you know. So yeah, so I, I think both approaches are valid. And I think if you, you can start with a high level construct, but I think you've got to get down to an individual business and then figure out the individual business and take it from there. Thank you. And one last question, Monish, what is your best pick right now? What, what is your 100% or 95% conviction pick? We haven't heard that one yet. I will duck that question. Oh, come on. We can't <laughs> duck that. This is a stock picking. We, we, we're stock pickers here. Right. The problem is that there's only downside for me. There's no upside for me. So one is I do not want to give you guys any names because one of the things is that I, I can't, even the Turkish bet could go to zero. Okay. There are weird things that happen in the world. So I cannot have Babson students lose money on something I tell you. So that's just a bad thing, bad outcome to begin with. And the second is that it's a really bad idea to buy something when someone else tells you about it. That's, you know, in general, the starting point is bad. But I would say this, that if you were a know-nothing investor and just getting going, then, you know, dollar cost average, S&P index over time, the important thing about getting wealthy is just two things. You don't need to, so, you know, there are three variables that drive the long-term creation of wealth. Three variables, okay? So one is the amount of capital, right? So how, how much money are you putting into the, into the pot? The second is the length of the runway. How much time do you have? And then the third is the rate of return, right? So these are the three variables. Now, the thing is that if for, for most of you, because you are so young, the good news is, and I think most of you may live past 100 because of the way healthcare is going. So the thing is, your runway is like 70, 80 years or more. So you have a really long runway, okay? Now, the second variable, which is the money you put in. So my daughter, my younger daughter went to NYU. Despite my best advice, neither of them went to Babson. Such is life, you know, a dad, you can only point the horse to the water. You can't make them drink. So anyway, she was at NYU and then, you know, she'd come back on these late night flights to to California. And one time when she was, I think, 18 and she had just finished working in the summer and she had made $5,000. So I told her, listen, this $5,000, can we open like a Roth IRA? And she said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And I said, you know, can you give me power of attorney to manage that account? And she said, yeah, sure, no problem. Okay. So I said, look, let's say I'm able to compound that 5,000 at 15% a year, right? Let's say, so there's something known as the rule of 72 which means that uh, you do 70 to divide by 15, which is approximately five. So at 15%, your money will double every five years. Life is all about the number of doubles. So I told her, listen, you're, I told her, Momachi, you're 18 now. What would this 5,000 be worth when you are 68 years old? If I'm compounding at 15% and doubling every five years. And, you know, it's like two in the morning, she's like falling asleep and whatever. So I said that it's $5 million. Okay. So now she's wide awake. She says, how does that happen? I said, well, you know, one double, which means when you're 23, it's 10,000. And then you're 28, it's 20,000. And then you're 33, it's 40,000. So it's doubling. So 10 doubles, which is what 50 years is is two to the power of 10. Two to the power of 10 is 1,024. So let's throw away the 24 because I cannot handle complicated math. So we have 1,000. So you have 5,000 times 1,000 add three zeros and that's 5 million, okay? So, and Uncle Sam doesn't get any of it ever. Awesome, okay? So, and I said then, you know, when you're 19 and you do another summer job, And how much will that be when you're 69? And she said, 
5 million. I said, oh, that's great. So now we have 10 million, okay? And then I said, at some point you will graduate and be able to save more than 5,000 a year. So at 22, you know, you might get a job 70, 80,000 or whatever, and you might save maybe 10,000 in a year or something. And in your late twenties, you might be making 200,000. So I said, what is the total of all these numbers? She said, my head would explode if I could figure that out. Okay. And the, the numbers become mind boggling, right? And does it take superhuman amounts of saving? No, you can even reduce the compounding rate. So if I take the 15% down to 10% and I increase the period to seven years, it's the same thing. It doubles every seven years, 72 divided by 10, right? So seven years. So if your runway, so instead of a 50 year runway, it was a 70 year runway, the end result will be the same. So the, the bottom line is we don't need great stock picks. That's not where the game's at. Because if I give you one stock pick, it'll run out of steam in two or three years. Then what are you gonna do? I won't be, I I won't be anywhere to be found, okay? And uh, then you'll be wondering, hey, where do I get my next stock pick, you know? So forget all that. Put it in the S&P. You'll own Apple and Amazon and all these other great businesses, which is just fine. And set it and forget it. And that's it, you're done. And the more important thing than which stock is your savings rate. There's a guy called Mr. Money Mustache. Raise your hand if you heard of Mr. Money Mustache. Nobody has heard of Mr. Money Mustache. Oh, one, one person, one enlightened person who's a major ardent. Are you a fan of Mr. Money Mustache? I love Mr. Money Mustache. So can you please, can you please invite Mr. Money Mustache to speak to you guys, okay? Tell him I told you to get him over. Anyway, so Mr. Money Mustache was a software engineer, okay? So now he has a blog and he's got, you know, big following and whatever. But when he was a software engineer and he graduated at 22, he, and I'm sorry I'm going over, I know, but, but hopefully that's okay. We'll be done in a few minutes. I'm, I hope that's okay. So anyway, so when he was graduating with his computer science degree, he knew that the gods were not so benevolent to land him at Snowflake. And then he just rides that coattail into becoming a billionaire. He knew that that was not what was gonna to happen to him. So he figured out, he said he assumed that when he graduated, he would get a generic programming job somewhere and playing a generic salary with a generic basic bonus living a very generic life. And his goal was that when he turned 30, that he would be financially independent and he would no longer be working. That was his goal when he graduated. So he said, I've got eight years and I'm not gonna be making high incomes and I don't need a great amount of you know comfort and such. I'm, so for example, Mr. Money Mustache would not be caught dead in a Starbucks, okay? I mean, $4 for a latte, that's not happening for him. I mean, he would just, you know, he would choke if that ever. For him, it's like more like five or 10 cents max for beverages in a day, okay? So, and the thing is like, you know, people graduate and they, they tell you, okay, spend one third of your income on housing and all that stuff. That's only for the, the, the mass uneducated majority. So he, if you go to his web, his blog, you will understand what frugality means. Okay, like he lives on like eight thousand or ten thousand dollars a year. A new car, not in three generations would he ever buy a new car. Okay, a three year old car, no. And so. Like now he's in the woods of Colorado somewhere. So he retired at 30. He made a lot of money, he retired because he had no expenses. And he's a carpenter on the side. So he built himself his own wood shack in somewhere in the middle of nowhere in, in Colorado. 
And lo and behold, in his 20s, he won, he, he met Mrs. Money Mustache. Okay, Mrs. Money Mustache is even more dedicated than him. She's even more frugal than he is. So it's very important that if you're going to be Mr. Money Mustache, that you find Mrs. Money Mustache. Okay, so now the two of them, completely financially independent, quit their jobs. He bikes everywhere for everything. And I think his annual consumption of gas is like maybe 15 gallons a year. Okay, like one tank a year. So to get really wealthy, the important things that you can control, because there are things that we can't control, we can control our savings rate. Okay, we may not be able to control our income, we can control our savings rate. You can also control the runway because you can just assume I'm giving you an 80 year runway. You know, the gods have told me to give it to you. So I'm just giving it to you. I'm just a very generous guy. So you've got the 80 year runway, you've got the high savings rate. We don't know the rate of return, but it doesn't matter because Mr. Money Mustache got it done in eight years and he's quite happy. So anyway, you can visit his blog and then you might not get any useful work done for a while, but that's okay. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure to hang out with all of you. Thanks again, Munish, so much. And we really appreciate you know, the flexibility and the time to go over. We're really privileged to hear from you and we you know, hope, hope that you come every year to Babson and give uh, a similar talk to our students. It would always be a pleasure to do that. It's wonderful. Thank you very much.